Hi, women of welcome. We are in the middle, uh, maybe not in the middle, in the second week of our Christmas at the Border series. And so I'm Sarah Casada. I'm so excited to be with you today to um, introduce you and chat with one of our friends at the Border, Abara. Some of you have heard us. Oh, they're already here. Let me see. It's working. I'm so excited for you guys to meet Monica, who works on their team. Yay! Hello! Hello! Man, I always feel like if we get the tech right <laughs> on the first try that we've really yes. done something. Um, trying to lower mine a little bit. I see that I'm off the screen now. Uh, there we go. Okay. This feels precarious and it may topple over at some point during this interview. So just, we'll just go with it at that point. Yeah, great to see it's you. It's so nice to see you. Absolutely. We're um, excited to be talking with different partners and friends along the border because this is a time of year where women in our community, we are always concerned and interested in opportunities to be generous at the border. But I think that is heightened this time of year. Of course, there's also different headlines and things like that. So we're so grateful for trusted partners who are on the ground at the border, like Abara. Thank you so much for being available and yeah, willing no, to talk with us. And honored so, to partner with y'all. Uh, absolutely. So some of you who've been with us to the border in the past, um, maybe have been at Abara. You might even know Monica already. But why don't you share a little bit about the region along the border where you guys are located and some of the work yeah, that Barra so, is doing? Yeah, uh, so we live where our organization is actually based in both El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, um, often considered sister cities here in the borderland. And it used to be really one city and it became divided um, a few hundred years ago. And but it's still very much like one heart. And so we love living here on the border. There's just so much rich culture. Um, there's a lot to celebrate. And then there's also a lot going on. And there is a humanitarian crisis manifesting in both El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. And so we're just really honored. Um, our heart is really to, to both tell stories about the borderlands. Um, I think uh, there's just a lot of misinformation and um, just a lot of harmful narratives that hurt communities that we really love and care about. And so we want to both push forward a more holistic and truthful story about what is happening here and the people and lives impacted. And we do that through Border Encounters, which Women of Welcome are maybe our most frequent uh, participants in that. You guys bring women from all over the country to come and see for themselves and meet the faces and just uh, hear with their own ears and see with their own eyes like what it's like to live here and what are the real issues and challenges and the beauty that exists here too. And so that's one big arm of our programming is the border encounters. And then the other is border response. And so um, we also just wanna be engaged in responding to the emerging needs that are manifesting in both El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. And so we have, we really try to have a very adaptive response. And so policies can change overnight. And so the needs and the flows also change very rapidly. And so we kind of hold these programming with loose hands and really try to just be in constant communication with partners to see what is the emerging needs this week, this month. Um, but this past year, we've had about six core programs. Um, we do micro enterprise and leadership equipping in the shelters and Juarez. Um, throughout this last year, we've actually had five different shelters that have hosted this program. It's like eight week long and the women have an opportunity to both um, generate income as they make bracelets and jewelry and then also participate in leadership equipping. And then that's led by Rosa, who if you come on a border encounter, you'll get to meet her, she's awesome. Uh, we also do art therapy in the federal unaccompanied minor shelters. Uh, we have an asylum narrative translation project where one of our friends who has worked as both a paralegal and a translator uh, comes and will sit and provide a safe space for uh, migrants to share their stories of asylum and get it transcribed and translated into both English and Spanish so that they can use it throughout their immigration case. That's really helpful for those who may never have an attorney during their case and will have to represent themselves and might not speak English. And so that's a new project. Um, we also do shelter leader respite care. And so for those that have come on a border encounter, you'll know that many of the shelters are run by 
local faith leaders um, in both El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. They never thought they would be running a 24-hour shelter and they just rolled up their sleeves and responded when people knocked on their doors. And so uh, we've just, we're close with a lot of these leaders. They've been doing this for going on three plus years now and many are really burnt out. And so we really see this as a way to like, an end in and of itself to care for those who are giving day in day out to welcome thousands of, of our global neighbors, but also it's essential for the sustainability of the shelter network that the leaders have community and the support they need to continue in the work. And then probably our, our most yeah. exciting and recent uh, program, it was kind of unexpected, but we just found that there was a lot of um, influx to the El Paso region, whereas the past couple of years, we've seen a lot in, in Juarez, especially with Title 42, with not many cases being allowed to proceed across the border. But there, in the past couple of months, up until recently, there were a lot of exceptions to Title 42. So we did see a lot of um, neighbors arriving and they were being processed by Customs and Border Patrol and the shelters were full in El Paso. And so when that happens, they'll just get released at usually at the Greyhound bus station, sometimes at all hours of the night with no place to go. Often they don't speak the language. And so uh, there is just an urgent call for leaders in El Paso, anyone, even if you're not in the immigration space, quote unquote, to open your doors and just help with some 24 to 48 hour operations. Mm -hmm. Most of these people arriving have sponsor cities or families and they just need a resting spot to coordinate transportation and get to that next space. And so Abara, um, when we're not hosting border encounters, we do have three apartments upstairs. And so we just found that during those times, we could certainly open those doors to people who just need a, a spot to sleep for the night, a hot shower and a warm meal. And so uh, we've actually provided housing for 62 guests um, just in the last three to four months. And so we're excited to continue to do this. And our hospitality coordinator, Gail, has been a, a huge um, leader in that effort. So yeah, that's kind of an overview, big picture that's of awesome. what we do here at, um, in the Borderlands. Well, it's absolutely a lot. And I will, I'll pull out a few things that you said that stuck with me. And one, just to give context for some of our women who haven't been to that area of the Texas border. And, and even though I think I knew this, somehow seeing it when I went to El Paso was really surprising. And that truly, when we talk about borderlands or border cities, when you look at one of the things Abara did was take us kind of up on this mountain to overlook the city. And when, and when I say the city, it is truly El Paso and Ciudad Juarez are like one giant city with a wall down the middle. And I think that's not what most of us think of, at least this wasn't what I thought of when I thought of the border. I think of kind of those images that you see of like sweeping desert and a, and a wall down the middle, but, or, you know, through it, but this, you know, we're driving on the interstate and the border wall is just yeah. right there next to the interstate. And I think that is a concept that for many in the Women of Welcome community, if you haven't been there, if that's not your context, it's hard to understand how much the, the physical border, but then also just kind of that, the rhetoric and things that we might read in the news and then move on with our day is really a part of the everyday yeah. life in El Paso. Yeah, definitely. Would you agree and with that? I found it fascinating because really the, it really truly was like a small fence for decades. And it wasn't, it wasn't like the wall that we know today until the last 10 years. And so it's really bizarre that like, there are so many people that live here who remember a time when like, it really was way more interconnected and there was so much more back and forth. And so it has really been like a stark contrast is like rhetoric has driven a lot of this like keep out mentality, but like that was never the perspective in like the years prior to that. Yeah, and I think that's important to help us understand a broader context that it hasn't always been like this. Like there used to be more collabor collaboration and, and sort of back, kind of what you said, back and forth. And so when we hear some of this, like there's, backlog or there's people well some of that has been created yeah. by creating this barrier way so um 
you know, it's not always something that has chronologically changed and like it's gotten significantly in one more direction or the other, but it's something that there's ways that things have changed along the way. And so you mentioned um, that you all work with folks who need access to lawyers. Did yeah. I hear that correctly? Because, or tran yeah. translators for lawyers? So Sorry, I just want to get a little who clarification. Anyone comes to seek asylum, um, there's both an affirmative and a defensive process. And the affirmative is certainly feels more like, like almost like a business process. Like it's a more of like, a, you're sitting down with an officer, but it's more like a meeting. But if you are at a defensive process, um, which could mean if your case gets rejected in the affirmative process, or if your case are initially was founded um, because you crossed without documentation and then sought asylum after arriving, you could end up in the defensive process. There have been some changes because there's just been so much backlog. So they make some exceptions. So it's not hard and fast. But if you find yourself in the defensive process with the majority and in recent years have been um you're in a criminal style court it's its own thing it's immigration court but you're before a judge uh do you like the government is the defense and you have to prove your case in what feels very much like a court of law and um there's varying statistics but having a lawyer can increase your chances anywhere up to 10 to 20 percent like 10 to 20 times as likely to obtain asylum if you have legal representation and a lot of it is people have very complex stories with overlapping details and some of the details they might share or even know to share might not constitute an asylum case but there might be something really important about their story they didn't think was important but it might prove that they were targeted for a specific reason like um, their gender, their ethnicity, um, their political affiliation, which would meet asylum criteria. Um, but if it's not a target because of a people group, even if you're under real threat, it wouldn't constitute an asylum case. And so there's just so much minutia to the process that someone who isn't here with like an extensive legal background or even an ability to read our websites and understand what these cases are, they're, they're, it's a life or death decision that's being up to their ability to communicate Absolutely. these very complex processes that are also very subjective. And so, um, I think it's helpful too for women to understand that un unlike, you know, criminal processing in the United States, you know, you have the right to an attorney. If you cannot provide one, we'll be afraid for you. That yes. is not the case in immigration court. The, we are, you're talking about a population who is not a US citizen, and so therefore they do not have those traditional rights that we're maybe familiar with, where people have, even regardless of their situation, they'll have someone to help um, represent them in court. And I think you mentioned how the stats show that if someone has representation, yeah. if they have access to a lawyer, whether that they're able to fund themselves or someone else, that their chances improve greatly, which one of the important takeaways of that is just because someone's asylum case was denied doesn't mean yeah. that they didn't qualify for asylum. It could mean that they just did not represent themselves and prove that case. It yeah. doesn't always mean that they didn't, you know, sometimes it can be viewed that, well, if they didn't get it, it's because they were trying to scam the process or they were trying to you know, and sometimes it's just as simple as they didn't have the support yeah, so that they needed to Yeah, so that's why we're so excited case. about Lika's program, and we're hoping it can expand. She's actually starting to train other people to also conduct these interviews. Lika worked as a paralegal at an immigration firm, and so her firm handled some asylum cases. And so aside from just being able to translate someone's story from Spanish to English, she also knows what questions to ask to, and understands the asylum process to pull out the details and make sure that those are highlighted. Um, and so we're really excited. Um, the services she's offering would easily, if you tried to go to an immigration firm to get this, could cost anywhere from 800 to $1,500 just to get your written copy because of the time that those interviews take and, and the translating fees. And so we, we had a generous donor um, that sponsored that project. And so, um, it's, it's on a small scale right now. It's kind of our pilot year and we're just excited um, to really get some feedback about it and, and see if we can make it grow in the next couple of years um, because it is a really needed need. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, you also mentioned um, the respite care for shelter. Um, yeah, shelter. Runners. I was, what would we, leaders, I guess. Sorry. 
Um, and I think, you know, when y'all took us across the border, I think one of the most impactful takeaways that I had was when we were sitting with a pastor in the shelter that I believe he and his wife were running. And I just assume, oh, you guys run a migrant shelter. <laughs> that's like your nonprofit or that's your work or that's, you know, whatever. I don't know. I guess I didn't think much about it. I was just like, here you are running a shelter. That's phenomenal. And then it became clear as he was sharing with no, no um, resentment, no anything in his telling, but it was like, we were actually doing, I think in that case, they had a very small um, shelter for women who'd experienced domestic abuse. And they had like, I don't even know, it was vastly more people staying there now than what they are typically designed and ready to host. And then other shelters that we went to, it was like, oh, we're actually not yeah. a shelter. We're just a church. Yes. We then bought all these cots and put them in our sanctuary because this is what people around us needed. And that really blew me away. I mean, to see like, oh, for lack of a better phrase, like you didn't sign up for this. Yeah. You're just answering the call. You're answering, you know, God's pull. It was very convicting because I think it's easy at least for me sometimes to sit back and like, well, let the professionals yeah. handle this situation. Um, and realizing that these were just everyday people of faith answering God's call. Yeah, and that's welcome. what really convicted Abara because when we see the people who are opening their doors and have really like, it's not like they have an abundance of time and money and space that's just laying around. Like these are people who are making huge sacrifices, saying yes when they don't even know where the funding's gonna come that day. And they don't know when the, if the meals are yep. going to come for their guests that day. And so when we thought about it, we're like, we have an apartment that is sometimes empty. Our whole staff is trained in like care for migrants. And we just felt like there are people with so many, so much less resources saying yes, that we felt like we had to as well. And it's been such an honor that getting to meet the people coming through and just even being the smallest part of their story, just for many, it's their first bed in America, their first night here, and just having that be a, a hospitable experience after months of journeying and uncertainty and just, yeah, just a really, really rough journey. And so, yeah, it's, we're really excited about that. That's exciting. Um, let me ask you, so we've, we've been asking different partners that we're interviewing what what have you all seen in your area the last few i've written it down weeks or months as far as it relates to the influx of migrants that you're receiving what has that experience been like in your yeah it's your been, area it's been heavy and overwhelming um and it's so easy to get politicized and i know the the busing there's like so many different takes like there's busing that certainly just seems to be to make a statement and then there seems to be some busing that seems to be attempts at coordinating some dispersion of of the influx just to communities that might have capacity and so it is really nuanced and messy it's hard to discern motives it's hard to understand like what is really happening but there is certainly for a long time there was a lot of people arriving and honestly more than the city could handle and that was kind of heartbreaking because I feel like the idea of like shuttling people to other cities, it, I, I hate it because it feels like you're viewing people like a burden that like, let's pass this on to someone else. And I just like want to communicate in everything that we do and just how we think and view about people who are coming and seeking asylum. They're people first. They're so much more than their migration story. This is a part of their story. Um, but then at the same time, like there is, a huge need and it's going to require like people from all over the country to be a part. And so um, I think what's, what's really been eye opening for me living on the border is that really like there is a need for like relief work, which is it's, it's hard because like everyone wants to like ask like, how is this sustainable? And a lot of this is, it's not sustainable. Like sustainable solutions would be immigration reform so that like there is, like viable pathways to come in and get a work permit expediently and then get on your own get on your feet and and have the tools to to settle here but th that's just not the reality right now and so as we wait for like some of those longer term solutions it is kind of all hands on deck it is rather uh just 
chaotic at times. Um, but at the same time, though, like if you come to the border, you don't necessarily feel like there's chaos, like there's a lot going on, but it's also very easy to not see it. Like there are people here who are not in any ways engaged in what's going on with migrants or immigration. And I, I think they wouldn't know any, any different. And so it's very much like there are the people in the city who are responding and playing a role. And, and for them, I'm sure it's, it's very stressful at times, but there's also people who are coming together and stepping up. And it's also been really beautiful to see the times that like, the need is met and people came out from all over and showed up and there were beds for everyone that that came and so yeah um i know one part like the one of the more heartbreaking situations has been with the venezuelans that have arrived um and we share this on border encounters but there there are um there's just it, there's a true crisis in venezuela i think 60 percent of people are malnourished um their hospital systems have collapsed and uh, like the, I'm doing a report for school, like the average doctor gets paid $10 a month, which to put in perspective, a carton of eggs would cost $3. And so there's truly like, it's very impossible to sustain a family and be able to provide for yourself. And the collapse mm -hmm. of the economy has led way to a lot of um, like rebel groups. And so aside from economic despair, there is, true violence that people are fleeing and so there is about 600 venezuelans that had arrived with the hope of coming and seeking asylum and up in the last couple of months there were so many title 42 exceptions that they there really were chances that you could come and cross and, and start your asylum case and then the weekend of october 15th there's kind of a abrupt ending to that and so overnight um, people were returned back to mexico and the shelter system was pretty inundated. And so many of the Venezuelans ended up setting up camps and you could see it from El Paso. Um, and the, Mex the Mexican government eventually opened up a shelter that could house 400, but uh, many of the Venezuelans didn't wanna go. Um, not so much because they, it wasn't cold out and they didn't want a meal, but they just felt like, like their presence there, like it was like almost protest. Like, we are people and we want to be seen. We don't want to just be shuttled into like a shelter where people can forget about us. And so that's been something ongoing. Um, and the bar has been a, a big part of helping supply food. Uh, we've had some donors send thousands of dollars just for food for my, migrants from Venezuela. And so trying to support some of these needs that just arrive that become apparent overnight just as policies have changed and where people are landing is moving around um, because right when you build up the El Paso infrastructure and shelters open their doors if policies change and people are now in Juarez those shelters will then close and they won't be ready when when it switches again and so there's so yeah. much like the back and forth really yeah. harms the ability for for there to be like some sustainable initiatives here and so that's one of the biggest challenges. Oh, that makes perfect sense. And I definitely hear kind of in your telling, you know, there's challenges with the increased influx of migrants and then challenges with the ever changing, it sounds like very sudden often policies that then immediately impact people on the ground, both migrants who are trying to navigate, a, you know, their legal access to asylum. And then also with the helpers who are trying to accommodate people and care for them and welcome them well yes. that all of this keeps changing um and so <laughs> that leads us really well into kind of our um opportunity for the women of welcome to be able to support the work abara is doing you know you definitely said two things which is that there is immediate relief need at the border um and then also that this is this is something that can't only be addressed by people living at the border and so what some people may or may not know is that many asylum seekers, when they come into the U.S. on the southern border, have family members elsewhere in the U.S. that they are seeking and hoping to join, whether that's in North Carolina or Iowa or Chicago, they are, their time at the southern border can be very temporary and they're going into other communities. So I would say to women of welcome, even if you don't live at the border, that doesn't mean you don't have the opportunity to welcome people who are arriving at the border because they may very well be in totally. your schools, churches, and communities, you know, with 
couple of weeks as they're seeking to connect with their own family members and support system while they wait for their asylum cases. Um, the second thing is that those of us who are not living at the border have the opportunity to support Avara. So maybe you can tell us how people who live in other parts of the country can, can support yeah, so the work that you if all there are doing. was a program that really pulled at your heart or you felt passionate about, uh, we do have like specific giving channels to support a specific program, or you could always give to our general fund on our website at avara.org. Um, we have a huge donation warehouse in the back of our office where we're always collecting goods. Um, a lot of that would be like toiletries, hygiene kits. Uh, Gail had shared a link that I'm sure we can put in the comments. Um, we have an Amazon wish list yes. that has the stuff that we're going to make like Christmas travel packs for some of the kiddos here in El Paso who are arriving and on their way that just has some Christmas candies and a coat and basic hygiene uh, goodies. And so that's always an option. Yes, let me interrupt there. Let Women to Welcome know we will be sharing that on our Instagram and other channels all week um, to make Christmas kits for kids who are arriving at the border so that they can have um, yeah, the resources so, that they need. Yeah, and then if you so want to come on a border encounter, we'd love to have you. Um, I just think it's always so powerful just to bear witness and, and lend people their time and say, like, I'm here and I, I see you and I want to understand more and learn more. Like, there's just something so dignifying about just your time and the attention you can lend to issues that are often, like, either completely swept under the rug or twisted for, like, a political purpose. And so come on a border encounter with us. Um, you can follow us on social media at Abara Frontiers on Instagram. We have Facebook. Um, and then you can also subscribe to our newsletter from our website where we'll occasionally share update stories. Um, and yeah, that's probably like the main, the main ways. Awesome. Well, Monica, thank you so much for your time and for speaking with our community. It's always a joy. We, we're just cheering Abara on and all of the things that you all are doing um, and grateful for the ways that we've been able to partner over the yes, years. Yes, thank you, so Sarah, thank you so much. thank you to the whole community. You guys have been so generous with Abara and have just showed up consistently for the last few years. And we're just grateful for your support and partnership and solidarity. Absolutely. All right, well, we will, we will post all the information in the comments and be sure to go and follow Abara and connect with them as well. Bye. Right, bye. Bye, ladies.